Thank you so much for watching It Is Written. This is the third part in a series that we've been doing on mental health, on depression specifically, depression the way out. You know, depression touches almost every family in the world, but it's often not talked about because it brings shame and embarrassment. But what we've been finding is that there's nothing to be shamed about. There's nothing to be embarrassed about that there is a way out of depression and it affects so many people and with some simple steps, we can find that way out. Our commitment at It Is Written is to bring a message of hope and wholeness. And I am so glad to have in studio with me today, Dr. Neil Nedley, who's been helping us bring that message of hope and wholeness and the fact that there is a way out of depression. Dr. Nedley, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Chris. It's great to be here. You know, Dr. Nedley is a physician of 27 years. He is an internal medicine doctor, and he has specialized in mental health and diagnosing the difficult patient. He is also the president of Weimar Institute, an institute that helps people experience health and wholeness through a lifestyle program that addresses general lifestyle issues and also a residential depression recovery program. Dr. Nedley, you have brought a great deal of expertise through our first two programs. And to our viewer who has missed any of those programs, they can go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash IIW Canada, and you can watch the first two of these programs. But Dr. Nedley... One of the things we've been talking about is the causes of depression, 10 generalized causes. And just as a point of review, can you review those 10 causes for depression? Yeah, we call them categories of causes, but genetics, developmental, lifestyle, circadian rhythm, addiction, nutrition, toxic, social, medical, and frontal lobe causes. And of those 10 categories of causes, how many of them can be addressed without the use of medication? Well, normally eight, seven to eight of them uh, can, and those can be reversed uh, through lifestyle measures most often. Very good. And in our last show, so I'd encourage our viewers to go to that show. In our last show, we covered four of those ways in which you, by some simple lifestyle changes, you can experience relief from depression. Correct. Now, one of the areas we weren't able to address is areas of the frontal lobe. Right. Okay. Now, first, tell me, what is the frontal lobe? What does the frontal lobe do? The frontal lobe is the seat of spirituality, morality, and the will. It's our decision-making portion of our brain. And our brain is designed to actually have this be the control center of our brain. But with depression, we will see the frontal lobe go down, also with anxiety, and we'll see the limbic system, where the amygdala is, that's where all our emotions are stored up, be in overdrive. And so the brain becomes imbalanced from that. And in order to balance it out, we need to enhance the frontal lobe function and circulation. Okay. So... We can talk about a lot of issues that affect the frontal lobe. And, for example, addictions, alcohol, uh, drugs, both legal and illegal drugs, impede the use of the frontal lobe. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that right now. But there's one issue that I want to address a little bit, and you and I have talked about this before. Entertainment. Yes. Can entertainment affect the frontal lobe? It can. Actually, one of the advantages of your viewer right now is they're not watching rapid scene of reference entertainment television, which suppresses the frontal lobe of the brain. It turns out the average entertainment television program changes its scene of reference every three seconds. And after you watch it for 90 seconds to at most three minutes, we'll see in the EEG the frontal lobe become dormant and go down. And it's actually addictive. And uh, it's why it can have a profound adverse effect on human behavior. 
Uh, and of course, there's been a lot of studies showing entertainment television, whenever it's introduced to the community, murder rates are going to double, rape rates are going to double. Uh, you know, morality does go down as a result. But when you're watching television that doesn't have that rapid scene of reference change, it can be very educational and you can still get an enhanced frontal lobe. So just simply changing our form of entertainment uh, can actually have a powerful effect in getting the frontal lobe to revive again. Okay, so just to review that for a moment to make sure we caught that, the average entertainment television is changing scenes every three seconds. Mm -hmm. Now let's just get into the, the physiology of that. What's happening when that frame of reference is switching every three seconds? What's actually, you, you said our frontal lobe lowers. What's actually mm -hmm. happening when our frontal lobe lowers? Well, because of that rapid scene of reference change, the frontal lobe, being the analytical portion of the brain, can't keep up with all of those scene of reference changes. And so it gives up, essentially. And uh, it actually enters uh, somewhat of a hypnotic trance. You're in alpha wave rhythm at this point. So your memory is working. You are actually able to have your emotions work. You can laugh and cry with the scenes. But you're no longer critically analyzing what's coming in. And so hideous things can happen that you would be diametrically opposed to. But in this trance, you'll actually laugh and not be really opposed to it per se. Wow, and so, and so once that frame of reference change has happened, our frontal lobe is lowered, then we're, then we're bombarded with commercials, yeah. and we talked about this in a, previous, in a previous show, and now our analytical mind cannot judge between what is a want right. and a need. Exactly. And is that kind of the path to how entertainment itself can actually lead to depression? That's right. What other forms of entertainment are going to have an effect on a frontal lobe and begin to lower that frontal lobe? Well, music, you know, heavy metal music, for instance, where the rhythm is very prominent and it's syncopated, uh, actually will cause the same type of phenomena where after 90 seconds to three minutes of this, the frontal lobe will start to go down. Uh, things that are too stimulating for us. Um, you know, Alvin Toffler talks about constant stimulation of the senses, shutting down the analytical processes. And so the ironic thing, you know, video games, for instance, a lot of these violent, fast-moving video games um, will actually suppress the frontal lobe of the brain and produce definite changes in emotions and human behavior uh, that are adverse. And so by some simple changes, and we've talked about simple changes in the previous show, getting some exercise, mm -hmm. changing the way we eat, adding mm -hmm. some things to our diet, mm -hmm. uh, and various things that are just very simple. Mm -hmm. So you're speaking now to someone who's depressed by simply changing what I watch mm -hmm. and what I listen to, mm -hmm. I will see tangible results in my feeling depressed. Absolutely. That is incredible. Yeah. So by just changing and committing yourself to watching more programs like It Is Written Canada. That's right. It's going to change our process and actually instead of lowering our frontal lobe, we actually see an increase in frontal lobe because we're educating and the mind is able to analyze. And through our mind being more analytical, if I'm understanding correctly, uh -huh. by our mind being more analytical, we're able to differentiate between reality mm -hmm. and fiction much more, uh, much more profoundly, and it helps us not to have these feelings of depression where I've seen something in uh, a non-reality, but I want it to be my reality. Yes, you know, ironically, Chris, we're living in an era today where there's more fun things to do than ever before in human history. Yes. But yet we have more depression than ever before in human history. Wow. Many of these fun things that can kind of grip us and actually make us think that we're entering a higher phase of existence, in reality, shut down the frontal lobe of the brain. And this is one of the reasons why depression has become an epidemic. You know, the Surgeon General is talking about the epidemic of depression in our society. Uh, and, you know, the, the chance, it used to be a one in four chance that a female will suffer from it, one in eight chance a man will suffer from it. They're now doubling 
those risks now with the epidemic of depression and anxiety going off the charts. And a lot of it has to do with these entertainment devices that are so readily available to humankind. Not, they're not recognizing what this is actually doing in imbalancing the brain. Wow. So we talk about the brain, we're talking about entertainment. A lot of this has to do with thinking. Mm -hmm. Now you recently, well, in recently being relative, you wrote a book called The Lost Art of Thinking. Mm -hmm. And in that book, you talk about how people have lost even the ability to think rightly. Mm -hmm. How can people begin to think better as they're making these changes, watching entertainment or listening to things that are educational, that improve the frontal lobe rather than decrease the frontal lobe, how can someone actually think better? Well, first of all, they need to analyze their thoughts, not just go into this repetitive robot type of thinking, but actually as they are thinking, analyze what they're thinking, why they're thinking that way, and look for distortions in their thoughts. That's what we train people in our book, The Lost Art of Thinking, to do. We talk about the 10 different ways that human beings, including myself, can actually think distorted thoughts. And the amazing thing is, is that it's our thoughts that cause our emotions and behavior. And in reality, that's exciting news because thoughts are something that we can change. Once our frontal lobe is enhanced so that we can analyze our thoughts, we can then recognize distortions in those thoughts, and then we can reconstruct those thoughts into what's true and accurate. And a rational thought is going to be a true thought that's not polarized. It's going to be a thought that helps us to achieve our goals, and it's going to be a thought that actually helps us to feel the way we want to feel. And with those three things in place, it is dramatic what happens. The frontal lobe goes up, our mood improves. If we're anxious, we're now calm. And if we're depressed, we're now actually feeling peaceful and happy, uh, just as a result of changing the thoughts. And so we talk about this issue of changing thoughts, changing how we think. Mm -hmm. But you know, each of, us, each of us live in a world that are filled with outside influences. And mm -hmm. one of the things that we as a society deal with is stress. Mm -hmm. Why don't we talk about that for a moment? Yes. What is stress? Well, stress is actually our response to stressors. Okay. You know, so a lot of times when people talk about stress, they're actually talking about what's coming at them from the outside. And of course, it could be heat, it could be cold, it could be pollution, uh, it could be deadlines, it could be finances. You know, there's even good stresses. You might be planning for a wedding that can be a stressor. Uh, and so uh, all of these things are outside influences, but our stress is actually our response to those stressors. And of course, the idea is we can have stress without distress, and uh, that's the goal. And that actually, our next show is entitled exactly that, Stress okay. Without Distress. Nice. And so we're going to talk about how to deal with those stressors mm -hmm. and how to deal with stress. Now, there's also this word anxiety. Mm -hmm. And often stress and anxiety are used interchangeably or as synonyms. Mm -hmm. But what is anxiety and how are anxiety and stress different? Well, anxiety is when you actually start to think more doom and gloom about the future. Anxiety actually is fear about the future. And it often manifests itself in physical ways. Rapid heartbeat, you know, shallow breathing, yes. gastrointestinal problems, headaches, you know, tingling of the extremities. Uh, and so there's actually 17 different systems in the body that can represent physical manifestations of simply anxiety. Often you do have um, sleeplessness um, with anxiety as well. Anxious people don't go to sleep as well. Mm -hmm. And so there's associated symptoms with the anxiety. And that's when we know that stress is not being dealt with in healthy ways. Okay. So anxiety is produced 
by stressors, which our reaction is, and we feel stress when we're when our stressors are coming our way. Mm -hmm. And then because we're not able to deal with it and think through how to deal with it in a healthy way, mm -hmm. then that produces anxiety. Correct. Okay. Now, how do those then play into this subject that we've been talking about, depression? Well, depression and anxiety go hand in hand. Okay. In fact, most people with depression have anxiety and most people with anxiety have depression. Now, you can have simply one or the other but it's not as common. They often go together. Okay, so anxiety and depression uh, usually come packaged together. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about this, and again, this is a hopeful thing. Yes. Because as we're talking about this, I don't want to oversimplify someone's life, but if I can learn to deal with stressors mm -hmm. in a little bit different way, mm -hmm. it will lower my stress, Yes. lower my anxiety, and lower the possibility that I'm in a depressed state. Exactly. So let's talk about stressors. What are some stressors in life? Or well, categories of stressors? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's good stress and there's bad stress okay. <laughs> as far as the stressors are concerned. And the, the bad stressors are the things that we can't really do anything about except to passively endure. Okay. Uh, and that doesn't really fit for most individuals. A lot of people are just faced with stressors that they actually can do something about. They have a deadline coming up in a week or, you know, in a few days. That's a stressor that you can do something about. Okay. You know, they have a relationship issue. That's something that you can do something about. Uh, and so uh, many of these stressors that we think are impeding us actually can even help us once we learn the appropriate coping mechanisms and actually become a more successful person. Okay, so when we have stress, whether that be good stress or bad stress, um, uh, or stressors, and I'm getting these terms mixed mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. uh, what happens to our body physiologically in that response to stress? Well, there's the fight or flight response, you okay. know, and that's when your heart races and you're ready for action and um, your digestive organs decrease in circulation. Those are physical manifestations of stress, and they're there to help us either fight or flee um, a situation. Uh, however, most of the stressors that we have today are not that way. We might have those physical symptoms, but we don't need to fight or flee. We actually need to cope. <laughs> okay, so, we need, so when you talk about coping, that's learning how to think Yes. and learning how to deal with whatever that stressor is. That's right, and that's when we get to the stage of resistance. You know, the first stage is more the acute um, stage, and then as we think appropriately, we can then actually resist it, and that's a healthy thing. Your, our immune system actually goes up when we're in the resistant stage of dealing with stressors. Okay, well, very so, so our immunity goes up, so that's a good thing as that's we right. resist stress. Now, is there a difference between ongoing stress or sudden stress? Yes, the, uh, the sudden stress would be, you know, like a tiger coming into this room right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would produce a, a flea mentality rather quickly. Yes, that's right. And uh, I'm sure even some of these camera people might feel uncomfortable with that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that's, that's there for a good reason. But, you know, an ongoing stress is one that, uh, you know, we might have a relationship issue in a marriage. And that's going to be ongoing until that situation is solved. Okay, and so a sudden stress is likely something that we, uh, while we certainly can learn to cope with, as you said, is if a lion or a tiger came running into this room, we don't have a lot of time to get educated on what to do other than to simply get on our feet and run and just hope that we're not the slowest in the group running. <laughs> okay, but in ongoing stress, this is where we need to learn how to cope. This is where we need to learn how to uh, resist uh, that stressor and... Um, and do something about it. Correct. Now, physically speaking, uh, we've talked about what happens physically when you're having stress, and it can be very debilitating. Uh, different diseases can be caused by stress, and stress can lead to anxiety disorders. Now, what are some anxiety disorders that uh, stress can lead to? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. Uh, obsessive-compulsive disorder, panic disorder, or panic attacks. 
And then there's phobias, you know, social phobias, agoraphobia, which is you know, fear of being in social situations. Um, these are all anxiety type of disorders. And then there's generalized anxiety disorder as well. So there's a number of different ones. Obsessive compulsive disorder, okay. uh, another anxiety disorder. And these are all things that can be helped actually in regards to how we think and improving our brain chemistry by, our, uh, by certain lifestyle measures. Okay, now we don't have a lot of time left, but once I recognize that I have a problem, our next show is gonna be stress without distress. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna talk about how to deal with this in very practical steps. Mm -hmm. But for our viewer that's watching right now, mm -hmm. that's saying, okay, I, I have to wait seven days to learn more. <laughs> what is one practical step or a few practical steps that someone can take today to help deal with stress and to cope with stress or stressors in their life? Actually getting their body physically healthy. So an exercise program, a good diet, a more plant-based diet actually helps with anxiety. Uh, it can help us think more accurate thoughts. And then another practical solution is that when we are faced with problems, these stressors, to actually not make it two problems. One is the practical problem of the stressor, and it's only a practical problem if it impairs our ability to achieve our goals. Yes. But if it impairs our ability to achieve our goals, give up the emotional reaction to that problem. In other words, have the mindset where I'm going to have this practical problem whether I'm miserable about it or not, so I might as well give up the misery. That helps us to feel calmer, and it also helps us to be in a position to do something more about that challenge. And so we can just simply give that up. And on this show, we've talked about that. We can give it up by giving it over to Jesus. That's right. And praying about it. And it's hard to believe that we're out of time. <laughs> but I think let's go ahead and pray about that. Yes. And hopefully help that person who's experiencing stress and anxiety in their life today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we can leave these things in your hand and you have promised us peace and rest. And that is our desire. And so today we give over those stressors. We give over the misery of those stressors and we give it into your hands and want to find that peace and that joy in our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.